God's word says that if you're a believer, you're on the team, and not a bystander watching the team. More important that you find a church to call home. Because it's your family. It's, it's the team that you're working with. God has placed you for a reason. What's the reason? What is God calling you to do? So football season has started. Well, at least preseason has, right? For me, one of the best, one of the best metaphors for the church in my job description as a pastor is probably a football type situation. I, like I get that, especially as a pastor. Sometimes, you know, when the Bible calls pastors shepherds, and that's what the word is. Sometimes I'm, I haven't done a whole lot of sheeping. Is that the right word? Sheeping, shepherding. Yeah, you get it. I can't even say it. You know, so I get, I get coaching, and I get football. And, and here's the deal, I, I, every season when football time comes around, I, I love these people that they sit back in their armchair, the big old bag of Doritos, you know, a two liter bottle of Coke, and they start yelling at the TV, if you would have played this play, that would have worked great, man, well, you should get that player off of there, hey, we need a new offensive lineman, hey, right? We call that a armchair quarterback. No armchair quarterbacks here, I'm sure, no one. Um, you know, but I think the church world is often very much the same. So, sometimes we can be that armchair quarterback or we can be the person on the sidelines and we're kind of watching the team, if you will, do what the team does. And we're like, you know, I would have done it this way or I would have done it that way or maybe you're cheering them on. But the whole time, God's word says that if you're a believer, you're on the team and not a bystander watching the team. Are you with me this morning? So this morning, what I want to do is I want to kind of continue a series we started last week about one and how God calls us to be one in, in unity, one in, in, you know, in, 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 our, in our faith, one Lord, and, and how although we're different and we have different roles to play in the kingdom of God, how we're really called together to be one. And so let me just kind of rewind where we went last week. And here's what we said in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And if you have your Bible, I would encourage you to open that. We're going to be in Ephesians 4 this week and again next week. And of course, we were there last week. And so we'll be looking at a few scriptures. But Ephesians 4, rewinding, he said, hey, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So we talked about last week that no one wakes up in the morning and says, man, today I can't wait to give up the things that I value so I can compromise and form unity. No one does that. No one wakes up with that kind of heart because it's tough. We all fight for our individual rights. We fight for ourselves. We said last week that it wasn't a whole lot different 2,000 years ago. As a matter of fact, it was probably worse. You had Jewish belief and, 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 and Greek belief trying to come together to form the church, and it was tough. So... We talked about how we need to keep the unity that the Spirit of God has already given to us and how we have to fight for that. We talked about that there is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope and you were called one Lord. And so it's not that, you know, I'm not serving one Jesus and you're serving Jesus. We're serving the same Lord. New life isn't serving one God and Calvary Baptist serving another God. I mean, we're serving the same Lord. It's the same direction. We're going the same way. So one Lord, we talked about one faith. So we said that, you know, we're not, we're not going to compromise on the things that are essential. So we are fighting for the biblical faith. And so it's not all roads lead to God. We're not, we're not saying that. We're saying that there is core foundational things that we can unite together in without giving up our distinctives. But there's some stuff we can come together in. Do you, amen? So we're going to fight for one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father and all who's over all and through all and all. And this is cool. So... He doesn't leave it there. I mean, he doesn't stop and say, hey, you know what? Now you just need to get in your assembly line and God just... And this makes people one after another all alike with the same personalities. So Paul never says that. He's a matter of fact, he says, listen, what makes the body so healthy and what makes us together as one is by you using your individual gifts and talents and personalities to make it a functional body. For example, there's not a single football team that I have watched. I've watched a lot of football. Not one that I have watched where everybody was the quarterback. No, I've watched them where they tried. And it didn't go so well. But every team 
that's got different parts within that team. You know, some parts are offensive lines, some parts are defensive lines, some are wide receivers, but every person has to know their part to form as a team. And the same thing with the church. Everybody has a part to play. It forms the team. It gives us unity in the body. I like how the Message Bible shares it. The Message Bible says you are called to travel on the same road in the same direction. So stay together, both outwardly and inwardly. And then it goes to the master, one faith. But look at, look at how, you, how the Message Bible shares this, verse 8. But that doesn't mean you should all look and speak and act the same. Out of the generosity of Christ, each of us is given his own gift or her own gift. Pivotal to our faith. Amen? Pivotal to what God has called us to be as a church, how God has called us to lead. And so here's the deal. God doesn't want uniformity. He isn't asking us for all to be the same. God, help us. Amen? He's asking us to say, hey, what is your niche? What's your place? What's the gifts that I've given to you? How have I wired you? What's the purpose I've made you for? How many people has God given a gift to? And if you have notes, this would be in your notes. How many people has God given a gift to? Each one of us. Each one of us. That, that, that God doesn't say, hey, you have one and you have one, but, you know, I'm not real partial to the left side of the church, so you guys, you know, just find your own way. But to each one, right? Every one of us, a gift. As a matter of fact, the New Testament shares five passages that talk about gifts, some between 20 to 23 different gifts that are given. And, you know, we're not going to go over that, but if you want to study this in your own time, look at Romans, and you know it's Romans 12, 6 through 8. So you might want to jot that down. 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10. 1 Peter 4, 11. And of course, Ephesians 4, 11. So Romans 12, 6 through 8, 1 Corinthians 12, 8 and 10, and actually, actually add in there 28 and 30. 1 Peter 4, 11 and Ephesians 4, 11. And on your own time, uh, take a look at that. But we're not going to go through all the gifts. But so we know that everyone has one. God gives everybody a gift. We know that uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 17 says to each one, the manifestation was given for the common good. We know that gifts are given to help fulfill God's purpose in our lives. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 26 says the gifts are given to strengthen the church. And so in other words, God, God, God wired you, he made you specifically because he has a place for you. And, and so that the gift that he gives to you is only for you because there's a reason why he gave it to you. Does that make sense? And so check this out. So if God gives you a gift and it's for you to use, that means if you don't use the gift, that means you're not fulfilling all that God has for you. That also means that I'm lessened because often the gifts that God gives are for you to bless somebody else. Church, we are a church in unity. We are one body, but not the same with different gifts, different personalities coming together to say, God, you know, what is it that you've wired me to be? Who have you wired me to be like? I mean, what do you want me to do? And I, that's kind of the question I want to pose this morning is, you know, what has God given to you? What role is he asking you to play? Gifts are necessary for a healthy church. Ephesians 4.13 talks about giving pastors and so forth until we all reach unity in the faith. The whole end of chapter 4 uh, talks about how we will attain the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. There will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there. So we see over and over again that God gives gifts so the church is growing healthy and we reach maturity. This is why gifts have not ceased. Has anybody reached maturity, complete maturity? Anybody? Raise your hand. Hi. One of you, maybe. Yeah, yeah. So here's the deal. Um, most of us will never reach full maturity until we die. Would you agree? Yeah. And so the gifts will always be present, always needed, until we're with the Lord. And we'll be like him at that point. But until then, church, listen, then we have got to be a part of the team. We've got to be a part of what God is calling us to do. We've got to be a part of, you know, God, where have you placed me? What is it you want me to do? How, what, how am I wired? God, get me a part of the team. Amen? Amen.
one of the things that I think is so unique we talked about last week is how as capital C, the church, the big church, all churches, how God um, uniquely wires every church. And so the individual gifts aren't just for you individually, but you know that, that God actually puts a unique vision and unique goals for the churches that meet together. Did you, did you know that? That, that, that? that God says, listen, your mission is the same. Your mission doesn't change. You're called to reach the lost. But how you fulfill that mission often varies. And I've been a part of a lot of different churches, and I, and I love, and I said this last week, but I love how they can sing the same songs, and yet there's a, unique, a uniqueness about every place I've worshipped with. And it's biblical. And some of you are looking at me like, what are you talking about, dude? Yeah, no, it's just biblical. Let me share with you a few uh, examples. So in the first 150 years or so, these are just a few churches that are mentioned in the Bible and just the uniqueness about each one of those churches. Ephesus was known for hard work and good deeds, how they would not tolerate wicked men. So they were known for hate, fighting for truth. Smyrna was known for the heart of giving, despite how uh, much poverty they had. So they were known for how much uh, giving they did. Thyatira was known for showing love and faith and service. And so if you said, hey, you know, tell me about that church in Thyatira. Man, you know, there's a church that they're all about service and they're serving people and they're known for their love. Another church by the name of in Sardis was known for being very active and alive. And so they were like, man, so have you been to Sardis? They're killing it. They're, oh, they're crazy. Right? I mean, they didn't stay that way because Revelation, in the book of Revelation, they get rebuked because once they were active and alive. But it, it, that's not the end of the list. Mary's house church has a unique kind of vibe to it. Lydia's house church. Aquila and Priscilla had a church. Uh, Nims had a house church. Uh, the Corinthians, if you look at the book of Corinth or Corinthians, I mean, just very unique, especially in spiritual gifts, very unique DNA. And so I think one of, our, one of our goals has to be, God, not just how have you wired me individually to be a part of this church, but God, how have you wired new life to be a part of your kingdom? Is, is, that, is that a fair question? And, and I think that's part of our responsibility as a church is to say first, God, you know, what is it that you're calling me to do? Who is it you're calling me to be? How have you wired me? That, that I can be a blessing. God, you've called me here. What, what is it that you want me to do? And then the second question is, God, and this is in your notes, I hope you take it home with you. God, within the church that I'm a part of, that I call my home church, my family church, New Life, what is it you're calling us to do? What's unique about us? What sets us apart from the other? Why did you, why did you birth us? Is that a, would, would you do that? Look at that and pray about this week. Because I, I mean, I really believe... I really believe that uniquely God has called us to be a part of something great. Amen? Amen? And one of the questions I get asked a lot is, you know, people that know that I, that I believe very much in kingdom of God ministry, that, you know, we can work together, people often will ask something like, well, do you have a hard time with membership? And the answer is absolutely not. I think because I believe in kingdom of God ministry so much, I think it's all more important that you find a church to call home. Because it's your family, it's, it's the team that you're working with, it's, it's God brought you to new life because he has a reason for you to be here, and if God isn't bringing you to new life, then you need to find a church home and call it church home and get invested in that church body and become a contributor and not just a person on the sideline. Amen. So I, I believe with all my heart that you need to find a church and say, yeah, God has called me here, I know he has, and, and I'm going to invest everything I have because God's a place for me, it's something he wants me to do. And even in the midst of that, how many of you know that things don't always go easy? If you, yeah, if you have had a job and you've taken a job and maybe you're choosing before the other jobs, have you ever taken a job and thought, oh, maybe I should have taken a different one? Or if you've ever moved, maybe, like, you know, maybe you're living in Florida and you're thinking, it's so humid here, and then you move to you know, Colorado, and it's so hot, or whatever it is, I mean, but, I mean, but here, I call it the grass is greener syndrome. Everybody familiar with that? 
I mean, it seems like no matter what part of our life, the grass is always greener. Hopefully not in your marriage, but I know some of you probably got married and thought, you know, maybe Lisa wasn't such a bad, I don't know. But hopefully you didn't do that. But we have this deal because we're always thinking, you know, the grass is green on the other side. So let me just help you real quick, okay? Every church has problems. It does. It's never greener. It always looks greener. It's just a different shade of grass. But most of it's yellow and brown anyway. It's been peed on and puked on a few times, and it's just it's not as good as it looks. You're just from a distance. So find the church, and if it's new life, I pray it is. Find your church home. Invest in your church body, because this is the place God has called you to. Not to say that we are the exclusive club, but to say this is my church home, and I love it. Amen? Amen. Amen. So Ephesians goes on to say, hey, we all have a gift. How are gifts given? But to each one of us, grace has been given. And I love the passage because here's what, if you look at first, uh, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7, he uses this little paraphrase and he quotes from Psalm 68. And at first it sounds really crazy because it doesn't make sense, but I'm going to try to explain, to it, explain it here in a moment. To each, one of the grace, to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ appointed it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and he gave gifts to men. Nothing to do with the song that John was singing about the big black train. It's not it. Psalm, uh, Psalm 68, 18 is referencing a time in Israel when they go back to remember how God delivered the Israelites out of Egypt he went on Mount Sinai and declared a covenant with Israel and then how he also talked about how he would destroy the nation. And listen to this. This is huge. And he would give them the, the nation's inheritance or he would essentially give them gifts from the other nations. And so in the New Testament in Acts 1.8, when it talks about Jesus ascending to our Father and pouring out his Holy Spirit, what he's saying is this, is that Jesus destroyed the works of the devil. He destroyed the enemy. He destroyed every power that Satan had. And then when he ascended, he gave gifts, gifts of the Holy Spirit to everybody. So it's that parallel. Isn't that, isn't that awesome? So the, man, it's so cool because, man, look at, look at, again, I can't go over, but look at 2.17 to 21, Acts 2.17 to 21 this week. Write that down, Acts 2.17, because it talks about how now the Holy Spirit is poured out on everybody, not just one person, how gifts are given to everybody, not just one person. It's huge. It's huge. But it says it's by grace. So that it's not, it's not the idea that you, know, you have earned something, um, or that you have arrived. You know, sometimes we're like, God, you know, I, will, I will be faithful in this ministry. Well, I will do this once I get this part of my life all measured up. And God says, no, it doesn't work that way. I accept you as you are. We need to be faithful. Amen? So he says, hey, just say yes. It's the idea of you know, Peter stepping on the boat or stepping on the water. The boat's there and the storm's there and he sees the water. He sees Jesus coming. Peter's freaking out because it's crazy, wicked, stormy. And who is that? Jesus and Peter says, can I walk out? Right? And Jesus says, step out. He steps out on the water. Scary moment. Steps out on the water. This is cool. Loses his kind of faith. Starts sinking. Jesus picks him back up. But I think... I think that's such a huge moment in our lives when it looks at stepping out in faith and the gifts that God has given to us. So he isn't looking for Peter to be perfect to step out of the water. He isn't looking for us to be perfect to step out, if you will. He's simply saying, listen, I want you to be obedient and trust me, have faith in me that I will lead you and when you make mistakes that I'll pick you back up and pull you to myself. I mean, to me, that gives me a lot of freedom as I just say, God, man, what gifts have you given to me? gives me a lot of freedom. gives me a lot of hope knowing that, you know, he's got my back. He's not going to let me sink. He's going to pull me back up and say, hey, you missed it on that one, but let's try again. Isn't that good? Continuing on through chapter 4, Paul goes from the gifts are given to everybody, um, talks about you know, the ascending on high and leading captives to his train. And then he goes to verse 11. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service. And here's where I want to camp for just a moment as we continue through, because I think 
This is probably one of the most under, under, misunderstood uh, areas of ministry. Let me define two terms first. Um, apostles. When we're talking about apostles today, we're not talking about 12. And so we're not talking about apostolic authority. We're talking about people that are being sent out. That's literally what apostles means, to be sent out. And so we're saying, hey, God raises up apostles, sent out. Church planters is usually what they are. God raises up prophets. Again, that Old Testament prophet, where it was one person speaking to a nation, God raises up prophets. As a matter of fact, the Holy Spirit has poured on all of us. Acts uh, 2.17 says, and that God has allowed all of us to prophesy. Did you know that? All of us are supposed to be speaking forth God's word to one another. But then it goes on. So he calls some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. But this is so key, to prepare God's people for works of service. And I don't know what happened around 250, 250 AD or something, but something happened where all of a sudden they moved from the church being the ministers to professional clergy being the ministers. And it's so not biblical. Something happened where, you know, the minister just did, you know, the guy at the pulpit, if you will, just did all of the work and, and he or she did everything and, and, and the people stopped. And, and I think it's been kind of this fight to reverse that because the reality is a pastor's job description, Pastor Bob's job description, my job description, Pastor Jake's job description, a teacher's job description is to do what? To equip people for ministry. To prepare God's people for works of service. Like my job is to get you to minister. Amen? Amen. I mean, that's my job. Let me, let me give you a list. If, if, if pastors or teachers and whomever was supposed to do everything, let me just give you kind of a, a crazy deal. The pastor would have to visit everybody in the hospital, visit every widow, every shut in, every sick person, meet with anyone at any time, be a part of every ministry that's functional in his or her church, be a part of the community reaching the lost, be on call 24 7. They need to study at least 20 hours a week for being a good student of their time and teaching. They need to be current at all contemporary issues. They need to have a very solid prayer life, they need to raise funds, they need to be an accountant. Need to be current and on, on all church legal issues. A pastor would need to be a peacemaker. He or she would need to do counseling, weddings, funerals, and jail visitation. Then they would set. They would need to set the vision for the church. They need to meet with ministry leaders. They would need to set ministry goals. They would also need to be, by the way, a husband, a dad, a friend, and a disciple. So, FYI, not happening. Church, I, I believe with all my heart that there are people uh, in our congregation that, that God wants to heal. And there's somebody in this church that God has given you a gift of healing and you've got to step out of the boat. I believe there's people in this church that God is saying, I want them to grow closer to me. I want them to walk closer to me. And it's your personality that relates to them. And they're not grown closer simply because you haven't stepped out of the boat. I believe there's shut-ins that need to be visited. They've been a part of our church for years and years and years. And not being visited simply because we haven't stepped out of the boat. I believe there's marriages that could be strengthened because there's gifts within this church body that are designed to strengthen marriages. I believe there's people that need to be one to Christ that aren't one to Christ because there's people within our church that need to step out of the boat. The list could go on. And so I guess maybe my, my encouragement for us this morning is let's believe God. Let's believe God to do a work in our lives and to cause us to stir us, if you will, in such a way that we say, God, man, you know what? What gifts have you given to me? And what do you want me to do with them? And how can I respond? One thing I love about Pastor Bob, 
So many things we love about Pastor Bob. Amen? Amen. And one of the things I, I just I love about him is in all the times that he's talked about his retire, retiring from new life, he's never once even contemplated the thought of retiring from ministry. And we're in the same place. Whether you are five or whether you are 80, there's never a retirement from ministry. Listen, the moment God says your work is done, trust me, you'll be with him in heaven. So I encourage you, what is God calling you to do? What is he calling you to be a part of? Whether you've been a part of our church for 30 years or whether you've been a part of it for day one, God has placed you here for a reason. What's the reason? What is God calling you to do? Let me just give you a list as the worship team comes up. Where do I start? How do I find out what my gifts are? Let me just go through a couple of things. There are, there's a lot of spiritual gift assessments, personality profiles, I and mean, by all means, take a look at those. As a matter of fact, in your notes, I give you a link to one that we use uh, quite a bit. And it's helpful. It is helpful. There's a problem with that one, but the problem is, is if you haven't done any of it, then sometimes it's hard to know if that's your gift. But, which leads me to my next point. Sometimes in discovering your gift, it's just simply trying some new stuff. When I first, when I first got saved at Fargo First Assembly in 1991, I mean, I, I did every ministry I could. You know, I did children's ministry. I did um, uh, door-to-door ministry. I, I did college ministry. Everything I could do. I mean, God just get me in doing something. When I came back here three years ago, uh, I, I'll, just, I'll, I'll just say who it was. So I, I love Royal Rangers. I think it's one of the neatest ministries, especially for the UP. I mean, I think it's, it's gold here. And I thought, man, there's all these kids coming, and, and uh, man, I really would love to help out and just love to speak into their lives, these young boys' lives. And, and I didn't tell the leaders, and leaders don't even know this probably, but I saw so I showed up one day thinking I could just kind of hang out. <sighs> it's not my gift. <laughs> Royal Ranger leaders are amazing. Absolutely amazing. I just... We went camping with the Royal Rangers this weekend, and I, I'm like, you guys totally rock. I, I was just praying today, God, I wish I had the patience of a Royal Ranger leader. You know, that's my new prayer. Let me be like a Royal Ranger leader. And so I found out just by trying it one day that you know, this didn't work for me. But I never would have known if I would have been so fearful of failure. You know what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? Sometimes we learn our gifts by just trying them. That's one reason why I love small group ministry. I love small group ministry because it gives you an opportunity, especially when it comes to the prophetic type gifts. It gives you the opportunity to fail and to still be loved. Because if you're in a group with your friends and you say something like, hey, Sally, did you have a tough time this week? And... And, um, you know, you're going through the struggle, and Sally says to you, <laughs> no, it was a great week. <laughs> oh, you missed it. <laughs> it's a good try. That's a little more difficult in this setting. That's why I love, I love prophetic ministry, and we've talked about this a lot. I love prophetic ministry in small groups because there's accountability in those groups, and people can say whether you nailed it or whether you missed it. It's a great place, if you will, to, if it's not a bad term, to say, hey, what gifts do I have? in that area. So sometimes it's a matter of trying. Sometimes it's a matter of asking yourself a few questions. So I'm going to ask you a few questions. Write down your answer. I mean, if something pops up, who or where do you have a passion to serve? Where do you have a passion to serve? Who do you have a passion to serve? Is there something you're just burdened for? I mean, it's always on your mind. It's always on your heart. It's burdening you. That might be one of your gifts in that area. What needs do you see? In other words, God opens up your eyes often and says, hey, listen, do you see this need in your church, in your community? What do you find joy in doing for others? I mean, you know, where do you find that joy? I mean, what makes you happy when you do this? That might be an, a good idea of where your gift might be. 
What opportunities has God already provided for you to serve others? That this door seems to keep opening up for me. I don't know why. Maybe it might be your gift. What's already working? For goodness sakes, don't reinvent the wheel, right? What are you best and have the most success in? Apparently, patience is not one of mine. What have godly people in your lives said to you? Or what godly people have said, hey, I see this in you. Well, I want to encourage this. I mean, as someone that you really admire as a believer, and they've come to you and said, you know what, I think you have a gift in this area. I really, there's something special about you in this area. That might be one of your gifts. But I think the simplicity of it often isn't in the great tests that we take. Sometimes it's not in all those questions. Sometimes we discover our role on the team simply by spending time with Jesus. I dare say often it's in those quiet times when we're alone with Christ that he begins to birth within us a vision. He begins to birth within us a, a dream. He begins to birth within us a need. And then our job is to say, God, man, I... Okay, I get this. You know, every time I pray, God, you keep bringing this up to me. Every time. Okay, I get it. You're saying something. Now help me to take the next step. And then take the step. Isn't that where we stop most of the time? Would you agree? Most of the time, it's not that, it's not that we don't sense God's call and we don't sense God leading us. Most of the time, we're fearful, if you will, of stepping out of the boat onto the water. And that just freaks us out. You'll never walk in water if you won't get out of the boat. You stand with me this morning. Father, I thank you for pouring out your Holy Spirit on, on all of us, God, for and the churches in our community, for this church. I just thank you, God, for the uniqueness of, of every church in our area and of this church. I thank you for the gifts that you've given to each one in this room. God, I thank you for those that you that you have called and you've planted as pillars in that new life, God. And, and, and you've raised them up. And I thank you for the new people that have come and how you've given them the gifts to, to help us reach one another and equip one another. And, and God, I thank you for that. And so Lord, I pray that you would continue to do that in, in our church body. Continue to help us to find the places that we're called to serve. Continue, God, to help us to see that it's our uniqueness of just using the gifts that we have, that it's, it's, it's us using those areas that make us one. Help us to see that, God. And if you're here this morning, and, and maybe, you're, maybe you're in a place that you know that God has been leading you, and you just, you know, it's been hard for you to say yes to, it's been hard for you to respond to. Maybe it's you're at a place where you're just like, you know what, Man, I know I'm supposed to do something, but I, I just can't seem to take that next step. Um, man, can I pray with you? I'm not going to have you come up. I just want to pray with you. Would you raise your hand if that's you this morning? I just, I just want to pray. Thank you. Thank you. Man, you. You know that God is leading. Keep him up real quick. And, and, and you've kind of been on that sideline a little bit, and you're like, God, I know there's something more I'm supposed to be doing. Anybody else? Thank you. And Father, I just pray for all those that have ra raised hands this morning. God, I, man, I, I just... Lord, I pray for a clarity in their mind. I pray for a clarity in their heart. God, I, I, I pray that you would, if you will, stamp, stamp on them your Holy Spirit in your direction. God, I know that Satan often comes as a liar and a thief and a destroyer, Lord, and, and you've been speaking into these people's lives, God, and Satan has come and he's taken it away and he's ripped it from them. So, Lord, I pray that you would put a hedge of protection, God, around those that are saying, God, what is my place? What is my role? God, I pray that you put a hedge of protection so that, Lord, when you speak to them, they would act in faith. Lord, do it this morning, I pray. Clarify. Clarify our roles in this church body. Clarify our role in the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hey, God bless you. Next week we're going to continue Ephesians 4. Um, and so I encourage you to be back and we're going to talk about kind of the foundation for all of this. It's so huge. So God bless you. Have a great, great week.